Welbeck had left me to face the charge of murder, and the most atrocious and plausible suspicions were now upon me. I must stay here until tomorrow, until someone can hear my cries and come to my rescue. What will people think when they see me? Terrified by ghosts and covered in blood, will they believe I am both a madman and a murderer? Watson's body will soon be found. If I change my bloody clothes and flee to the countryside before then, won't I be pursued with the most vehement suspicions, and perhaps even hunted down by the authorities? I am innocent, but my story, no matter how detailed or true, may not be enough to clear my name. My flight will be seen as proof of my guilt. As I was consumed by these thoughts, I noticed a faint light at the bottom of the staircase. It grew stronger, lingered for a moment, and then disappeared. It might have been from a lamp or candle held by someone walking through the halls, but it seemed more likely to be something otherworldly. Despite my fear of supernatural danger, I chose to believe the latter explanation and steeled myself against it. I thought again about the risks and suspicions I faced by staying in this place. Suddenly my attention was drawn back to the light, which had returned and was now steady. It was very dim, but the darkness surrounding it made it shine like a bolt of lightning. For a moment... I watched it without moving, expecting it to vanish at any second. But when it remained, I felt a surge of hope and curiosity, and decided to investigate its source. Although I couldn't fathom why I had been set free, I couldn't help but think there was a connection between my release and the reason for my imprisonment. Just as I was about to head down the stairs, I remembered the cellar's small, grated windows that allowed light from the street to seep in. If I had gone down the wrong staircase... I would have been drawn to the light. As I made my way back down, I noticed that the long passage was lit up. Following the source of the light, I saw Welbeck in the cell I had just left, digging up the earth with a spade. I was stunned, but then I realized my mistake. I had taken the wrong staircase and ended up in a different cell. Welbeck had meant me no harm and was searching for the tool he had mentioned. I felt guilty and embarrassed, but at least I was no longer imprisoned or accused of anything. To ensure my safety, I had no choice but to return to the cell I had just left where Welbeck was still digging. He looked up when he saw me, and his face showed momentary shock at the sight of my bloody face. However, he didn't say anything and continued with his work. I didn't know if he had guessed the cause of my escape, or if he was too preoccupied with his task to notice my condition. The unfortunate Watson was given a shallow grave, and covered with a thin layer of clay. Welbeck's movements were quick and shaky and his expression suggested a mind consumed by a singular purpose, unrelated to the scene around him. His features were so intense and fixed that I suspected his sanity was compromised. Once he had finished, he tossed aside his tool and handed me a pocketbook that belonged to Watson, saying it might contain something useful to the living. I could do with it what I pleased. He then went back up the stairs, placed the candle on a table in the hall, opened the main door, and left. I followed him, mechanically, as if compelled to do so. I did it because he wanted me to, and because I didn't know where else to go. The streets were empty and quiet, and the faint sound of the watchman's call only added to the solemnity. I followed him, feeling a state of mind that is difficult to describe. I didn't have the energy to ask where he was headed. It wasn't until we got to the water's edge that I convinced myself to speak up. I started to think about how Welbeck's current plans might jeopardize us both. I had been acting like a slave and a robot for too long, following blind and foreign impulses. It was time to break free and demand to know where this path was leading. In the meantime, we found ourselves among boats and ships, and I can't say for sure where we were. I only know it was the end of one of the main streets. Here, Welbeck chose a boat and got ready to board it. For a moment, I hesitated to follow his apparent invitation. I asked, stuttering, Why? Why do we need to cross the river? "'What can I assist you with?' I asked. "'I need to know the purpose of my journey before I embark,' he replied. He paused, studying me in silence for a moment before continuing. "'What do you fear? Have I not explained my intentions? "'I simply need you to cross the river with me as I am unable to navigate the boat alone. "'Is there anything difficult or mysterious about this task? "'We will part ways on the Jersey shore, "'and I only ask for your silence and discretion regarding our journey.' He climbed aboard the boat and urged me to follow. Reluctantly I complied, and noticed that there was only one small oar in the boat. He appeared panicked and vexed by this discovery, exclaiming, It will be impossible to find another oar at this hour. 
What are we to do? However, this obstacle was not insurmountable. I possessed strong arms and was skilled in using an oar for both rowing and steering. I took my position at the back of the boat and quickly maneuvered it away from the nearby docks. Although I was unfamiliar with the river's path, I knew of the bar that obstructed it. I was unsure of its exact location or how to avoid it with the current tide. But I remained focused on the oar. My companion sat at the front of the boat, largely unnoticed. Occasionally I glanced back at the scenery we had left behind. The novelty of my situation, coupled with the events that had led me there, left me in a state of suspense and wonder. My hand frequently slackened, allowing the vessel to be carried aimlessly by the downward current. Lights were scarce, and those that were visible flickered and danced as masts, yards and hulls passed before them. As we moved further from the shore, the clamour grew louder, suggesting that the city was in chaos and turmoil. The hour of twelve was cried out from all directions, mingled with the baying of dogs, filling me with trepidation and alarm. Suddenly my attention was drawn to Welbeck's conduct. We had only moved a short distance from the shore when he plunged into the water. My first thought was that something had fallen overboard. When I looked back, I saw that his seat was empty. My surprise caused me to loosen my hold on the oar, which floated away. The water's surface was smooth as glass, and the eddy created by Welbeck's sinking was barely visible. I couldn't determine whether this was intentional or accidental, and the suddenness of it all left me unable to react. My gaze darted around, searching for any sign of Welbeck's resurfacing. After some time, the sound of agitation in the water drew my attention to a distance. The darkness made it impossible to see anything clearly, but the noise was unmistakable. It sounded like someone was struggling, fighting to stay afloat before ultimately sinking to the bottom. There was no cry for help, and I listened with painful eagerness, but there was no third signal. Welbeck had sunk, never to rise again. I was so consumed by the sudden and terrible tragedy that I was momentarily unaware of my own situation. The rapid movement of the lights on the shore indicated that I was being carried away by the tide. I was clueless about how to save myself from drowning or how to reach the shore again since I had lost my oar. I had no idea where the current would take me if I didn't take control of my vehicle. As the lights and buildings vanished and the noises faded, I realized that I had left the town behind. There was no time to waste. The only way to reach the shore was to swim. I was confident that I had enough strength and skill for the task. I discarded my loose gown, put Watson's pocketbook in my mouth to keep it dry, and plunged into the water. I landed on a muddy and reedy spot, which made it difficult for me to extricate myself. I was knee-deep in mud and exhausted from the effort. Eventually, I managed to reach solid ground and collapsed on the grass to regain my strength and contemplate my next move. I had never been in a situation like this before. The events of the past three days were like a surreal dream. They were etched in my memory with such vividness that it was difficult to believe they were real. They left me feeling disoriented and dazed, and it took me a long time to regain my composure. Gradually I started to make sense of my thoughts and form a plan for my future. Welbeck was no more, and his creditors were left with nothing. All that remained was the furniture of his house, which Mrs. Wentworth would claim to settle the unpaid rent. I wondered what would happen to Mademoiselle Lodi, who was alone and without any friends. The question that plagued my mind was where she was hiding. Welbeck had not given me any hint as to where she might be, leaving me completely in the dark. My ignorance of her whereabouts meant that even if I had the power to help her in any way, I would be unable to do so. However, I couldn't shake off the thought of the murdered person. He had vanished without a trace. Eventually, his fate and the location of his burial would come to light. I wondered if I would be able to escape the consequences of my actions. Watson had family and friends and his death would undoubtedly have an impact on their lives. It was clear to me that I needed to investigate his pocketbook to see if there were any papers that could shed some light on his situation. I got up, not knowing where to go. I was soaked to the bone, shivering with the cold, had no place to stay, no friends to turn to, and no money or possessions to speak of. I walked aimlessly, and before long, I found myself on the outskirts of town. In the distance, I could see the faint glow of a lamp, and I made my way towards it. I stopped to examine the contents of the pocketbook and found three banknotes, each worth fifty dollars, wrapped in a blank piece of paper. 
There were also three letters, written by Watson's wife, dated from Baltimore. Although brief, they were filled with tenderness and made reference to their child. Judging from their content and date, they were written while he was away on his most recent voyage, and his wife was in dire straits, with needs that had grown during their prolonged separation. The fourth letter was addressed to Mrs. Mary Watson and was open. He wrote to her from Philadelphia, letting her know that he had arrived from Santo Domingo, but that his ship and cargo were lost. He intended to hurry home as fast as possible, bringing with him only $150 to help with her urgent needs. The letter was signed, folded, and addressed, but not yet sealed. I considered how I should behave in this situation. I put the banknotes in the letter and sealed it with a wafer, of which a few were found in the pocketbook. I debated whether to add anything to the letter with the pencil that was lying nearby, but I decided against it. I couldn't find the right words to express the sad truth. I decided to leave the letter at the post office, where letters could be dropped off at any time. As I thought about my own situation, I wondered what fate had in store for me. It was impossible to predict how my safety might be affected by staying in the city after Welbeck's disappearance and my connection to the runaway. My fears conjured up countless difficulties and inconveniences that could arise from this situation. Moreover, why should I stay? Who could I turn to for protection or employment? Every avenue, including subsistence, was closed to me. The countryside was my only refuge. There I could at least buy food, safety, and rest with my labor. But if I chose to go to the countryside, there was no reason to delay. It would be wise to leave the city and be far away before the sun came up. Meanwhile, I shivered and rubbed my uncomfortable clothes. Feeling the need to change my clothes for something more suitable, I decided to return to Welbeck's house. I reasoned that the servants were likely undisturbed and the door unlocked, making it easy for me to enter and retrieve my own garments without drawing attention. Although I had some reservations and uncertainties, I resolved to proceed with this plan. After leaving my letter at the office, I made my way back to my former residence. Approaching the house cautiously, I lifted the latch quietly. There were no signs of any disturbance. I found a light in the kitchen and made my way softly and hesitantly to my chamber. There, I changed out of the unfamiliar attire and put on my check shirt, trousers, and fustian coat. With this transformation complete, my only remaining task was to swiftly venture into the countryside. As I briefly reflected on the past, Welbeck's initial reason for keeping me in his service came to mind. However, I understood the danger of speculating loosely on matters of property. I did not question Mrs. Wentworth's right to any trinket or piece of furniture in the house, considering it as her due for Welbeck's failure to pay rent. But there was one thing I yearned to possess, and I felt no qualms or scruples in obtaining it. The manuscript mentioned by Welbeck, supposedly written by the deceased Lodi. With my knowledge of Latin and familiarity with the related Tuscan language, I believed that acquiring this manuscript could greatly contribute to my studies and benefit me in various ways. I assumed Welbeck put the manuscript where he kept his printed books. I entered the room that had witnessed the disastrous encounter between him and Watson. Each step I took filled me with trepidation, half expecting the spectre of the latter to appear before me. The shelves were adorned with numerous magnificent volumes, their covers gleaming behind glass doors. I swiftly scanned the titles, fortunate enough to discover the book I sought. Securing it without hesitation, I left the candle unlit on a table in the parlor and ventured back into the street. Filled with a mix of light-footedness and a racing heart, I set my course toward the countryside. Considering my destitute circumstances, I justified crossing the Squealkill Bridge without paying the toll. It wasn't until I had traveled nine miles from the city that the eastern sky began to brighten with the dawn of morning. These events, spanning five days of my life, formed a tale I wish to share with you. They were the profound experiences that had provided me with more wisdom than my entire previous existence. I have revealed these details concerning Welbeck's crimes and misfortunes, prompted by Wortley's insinuations and my desire to maintain your good opinion of me. Chapter 13 Slort took a break, giving his listeners time to ponder the details of his story and compare them to their own observations. Through my work, I became friends with Mrs. Wentworth, who shared many details about Welbeck after he disappeared. Mrs. Wentworth, upon hearing Slort's account and considering his demeanor and appearance during their meeting, became convinced that he was the person Welbeck had referred to 
the one who possessed information about Clavering's fate. She had been eager to learn the details from Welbeck himself, but was met with evasiveness. When Slot arrived, her suspicion was aroused, and their conversation only reinforced her belief. Despite her efforts to extract more information from Slot, he remained persistently silent, leaving her perplexed. Growing increasingly uneasy, she sent a messenger to Welbeck requesting a meeting. However, Gabriel, the black servant, informed the messenger that Welbeck had gone to the country for a week. When a second messenger was sent at the end of the week, he received no response to his calls and knocks. Upon investigation, it was discovered that the house was completely deserted, with all entrances closed. These circumstances naturally gave rise to curiosity and suspicion. The house was thoroughly examined, but it remained empty and silent. The creditors of Welbeck, alarmed by these developments, were unable to lay claim to the property inside the house, as Mrs. Wentworth, being the owner, had the legal right to the furniture in place of the unpaid rent that Welbeck had allowed to accumulate. Valuable and portable items, including linen and silverware, were removed, while the remaining belongings were seized as collateral. However, an epidemic outbreak disrupted the sale of these items, adding further chaos to the situation. The situation remained unchanged, and the house was carefully secured. We did not have time to speculate on the reasons behind this desertion. However, a young man's narrative provided us with an explanation. It is likely that the servants, seeing their master's prolonged absence, had looted the house and fled. Though we were no longer curious about Welbeck, we wanted to know how Slaught had returned to the city and ended up in the same location where I had met him earlier. We expressed our desire to hear his story, and the young man agreed to continue the tale the following evening. We locked ourselves in early and waited for him to begin. I had mentioned that I had travelled many miles from the city by sunrise. I intended to stop at the first farm and work as a day labourer. The first person I saw was an elderly man in simple clothing, who exuded habitual kindness despite his age. He was walking through his buckwheat field, measuring the almost ripe harvest. I approached him hesitantly and explained my situation. He listened attentively and asked about my family, name and skills. I answered truthfully and openly. Well, he said, I think we can make a deal. Let's try each other out for a week or two. If it doesn't work out, we can change things up. The morning is chilly and damp and you don't look very comfortable. Come to the house and have some breakfast, the good man said to me. The kindness and warmth of Mr. Hadwin and his family filled me with gratitude and joy. I felt as though I had found a father figure, and entering their house was like coming home after a long absence. The sense of desolation and loneliness that had plagued me was replaced by the embrace of paternal care and the tenderness of friendship. Every aspect of this household reinforced and heightened these emotions. The family consisted of Mrs. Hadwin, two affectionate and simple-minded daughters, and their servants. The genuine and unpretentious manners of this family, along with the tasks assigned to me, the surrounding land, its fresh air, enchanting walks, and abundant fertility, presented a stark contrast to the experiences I had left behind. These new surroundings aligned perfectly with my understanding and the sentiments that burned in my heart. Despite my youth, my intellectual cultivation and cautious demeanour earned me respect and trust. Mr. Hadwin came to regard me with a mixture of the simplicity of a farmer and the devotion of a Quaker, combined with a blend of humanity and intelligence. The sisters, Susan and Eliza, had not been exposed to the hardships and vices of the world either through direct observation or through books. While they lacked formal education, they possessed curiosity, discernment, and a determination to make the most of their limited resources for learning. The elder sister, Susan, exuded a composed demeanour that contrasted with the lively and untamed vivacity of the younger, Eliza. However, they shared smiles and tears in unison. Though they had different personalities and ways of approaching ordinary matters, they remained in harmonious accord on significant occasions. They thought and acted differently, but not in discord. Their diversity of character enriched their relationship rather than causing conflict. Having immersed myself in the company of Susan and Eliza, two young women of their age and disposition, my romantic and untutored nature was naturally susceptible to strong impressions. It was not long before I discovered that Susan had already found someone to whom she had given her affection. However, Eliza remained free, and gradually, 
almost imperceptibly, she began to captivate my heart. Thoughts of her consumed me, whether she was present or absent, and my mind was constantly filled with daydreams and fantasies. Even the recent significant events that had taken place failed to divert my attention from the intensity of my newfound emotions. As time went on, my thoughts turned to the future, and with that came a sense of caution and apprehension. My current work was light and sufficient for my own sustenance as a single man, but marriage would introduce new needs and responsibilities. Mr. Hadwin's possessions were modest and would not be enough to support both of his daughters adequately if divided between them. Furthermore, any division of his estate could only occur upon his death, which was neither desirable nor imminent. Another obstacle arose in my mind. Mr. Hadwin was a devoted member of a religious sect that prohibited marriages between its followers and those of different faiths. I, on the other hand, had been brought up with beliefs that were in direct opposition to Quakerism, and I could not envision myself converting to their faith. It seemed that my only options were to pretend a false conversion or to convince Eliza to abandon her beliefs and consent to a secret marriage. The choice between hypocrisy and honesty required no deliberation. Even if I were offered unimaginable wealth and success in exchange for deceit, it would be instantly rejected, as nothing could outweigh the joy of being united with Eliza Hadwin. Although I lacked abundant external possessions, I possessed the invaluable treasure of a clear conscience. In comparison to this, the allure of material wealth, boundless ambition, and luxurious pleasures seemed trivial and shallow. Conquering Eliza's doubts and misconceptions was a simple task, but I knew that introducing discord and sorrow into the Hadwin family would be an act of ingratitude and moral corruption. It was evident that the fulfillment of my desires lay beyond my grasp. To nurture my passion would be to cultivate a disease that would either erode my integrity or consume my existence. It was essential to redirect my thoughts toward a different object and even restrict my interaction with Eliza. Engaging in activities that would distract me from her presence and contemplating subjects unrelated to my beloved became challenging endeavors. The latter proved to be the more difficult of the two, as I had to resist the pleading and reproachful gaze that wondered why I had withdrawn my affections. Eliza herself remained oblivious to the true nature of her own feelings, which made her less cautious in expressing her sentiments. Previously, my companions and my own musings had sufficed to occupy my time, but now my newfound motives compelled me to seek methods of controlling and diverting my thoughts. It was during this period that the idea of delving into the manuscript of Lodi resurfaced in my mind. I had already determined, during my journey to this place, to make the study of the language contained in that book and the translation of its contents into English the focus and solace of my leisure. Now, with renewed determination, I embraced this resolution. It might be deemed an unconventional project, as the ancient Italian language bore a strong resemblance to the modern tongue. My knowledge of the former would serve as the conduit for acquiring the latter. I had no grammar or vocabulary to guide me in understanding the nuances and variations of Tuscan words compared to the Roman dialect. Each sentence and phrase required careful consideration, multiple conjectures and patient scrutiny to determine the most plausible interpretation. While this undertaking may seem fantastical and impractical, I discovered through experimentation that it was within my capabilities. The detailed account of my progress would be both fascinating and instructive, demonstrating the obstacles that can be overcome through human ingenuity and perseverance, the achievements possible through determined and solitary efforts, and how the mind, unaided, can uncover the principles of linguistic inflection and arrangement. It would highlight the mind's ability to draw upon remote, analogous, and latent similarities. However, for now, I must omit this enticing topic. My progress was slow but immensely gratifying as I perceived gradual improvement with each passing hour. As I neared the final pages, I was able to follow the eloquent narrative with little interruption. It described the triumph of a leader of outlaws over the popular enthusiasm of the Milanese and the claims of neighboring powers. The condottiero Sforza had sought refuge from his enemies within a tomb, accidentally discovered amidst the ruins of a Roman fortress in the Apennines. Although he initially sought this hiding place for concealment, he unexpectedly found a treasure within that could help him secure the wavering loyalty of his band of mercenaries as long as he could evade capture by his pursuers. My curiosity was heightened, and I eagerly read on, only to have my excitement abruptly halted when I discovered that the following pages were stuck together at the edges. 
Separating them without damaging the written content proved to be a challenging task. Impatiently, I attempted to tear the edges apart, resulting in the edges being torn away and the leaves finally separating. Contrary to expectations, I did not pick up where the story left off. Instead, what I found concealed among the sealed pages was beyond anything my wildest imagination could have foreseen, yet it held a faint resemblance to the images that had occupied my mind. I opened it, and to my astonishment, it was a banknote. The initial surprise quickly gave way to a conjecture that the remaining sealed pages might contain more of the same. Hastily separating them proved my conjecture right. There were indeed more bills hidden within. The sensations that washed over me at this discovery were indescribable. I silently gazed at the notes, running my fingers over them, examining their details, adding up their sum, and repeating to myself, Twenty thousand dollars. They are now mine, acquired through such means. This fortune could have saved Welbeck from his ruinous circumstances. Unfortunately, the dying Lodi had been unable to convey the full contents of this precious volume. He had divided his treasure between this book and his pocketbook as a measure of safety, but his sudden demise prevented him from explaining his precautions. Welbeck had placed the book in his collection intending to read it some day, yet his anxieties deterred him, ultimately leading him to desperation and suicide. This discovery could have saved him from his tragic fate, but was it a regrettable event? This sum, like the previous one, would likely have been squandered in the same reckless extravagance. While his life might have continued for a while longer, his deep-rooted vices would have inevitably led to the same disgraceful and ignominious end. Welbeck's destiny had been fulfilled. The money had come into my possession without any guilt or deceit. My fortune had taken an unexpected and marvellously fortuitous turn. How could I benefit from her generosity? Would this fortune not tempt me to indulge in worldly pleasures? Carriages, grand mansions, numerous servants, luxurious decorations, lavish feasts, and insincere flattery were repugnant to both my taste and principles. The accumulation of knowledge and the promotion of happiness, wherein wealth can be profoundly instrumental, were my sole moral obligations and paths to true joy. However, I questioned my right to this money. By keeping it, would I not be as culpable as Welbeck? While it came into his possession, and now mine, without a crime, I am equally aware of the true owner, and the claims of the unfortunate stranger remain valid. If we measure justice by utility rather than mere legality, her claim is undeniable, considering her desolate and impoverished state her inability to contend with adversity due to her past life and sheltered upbringing. As for myself, good health and diligence would provide me not only with the modest means I seek, but also the ability to enjoy them. If my present circumstances remain unchanged, I shall not be unhappy. My current pursuits are wholesome and praiseworthy. I am unburdened by the cares and pleasures of wealth. I possess ample opportunities for acquiring knowledge, as long as I have the ability to observe humanity and nature, whether in their original state or through books, the obligations of my duty are clear. I must seek out the lady and return the money to her. However, certain obstacles hindered the immediate execution of this plan. How should I conduct my search? How could I justify my sudden withdrawal, contrary to the terms of the agreement I had recently made, from the company and service of my friend and benefactor, Hadwin? My mind was abruptly pulled away from my investigations by a rumor that had grown to alarming proportions and finally reached us in our peaceful abodes. We were informed that the city was in turmoil and chaos as a deadly disease had begun to spread. Officials and ordinary citizens were fleeing to the countryside. The number of sick people was multiplying beyond all known records, even those in the plague-ravaged cities of the Levant. The illness was virulent and unrelenting. Normal activities and pleasures of life had come to a halt. Fear had erased all natural emotions. Husbands abandoned their wives, and parents deserted their children. Some had locked themselves in their homes, cutting off all contact with the outside world. The terror had driven others insane, and their misguided steps led them into the very danger they had previously avoided. People were struck down by the disease in the streets, and passers-by ran from them. They were not allowed to enter their own homes and died on public thoroughfares. The sick were left to die from neglect, and no one was willing to remove the lifeless bodies. The rotting corpses filled the air with deadly fumes, multiplying the devastation tenfold. This story was distorted 
and embellished in a thousand different ways by the gullibility and exaggeration of the storytellers. At first I listened to the tale with indifference or amusement, thinking it was too absurd to be true. The enormity and variety of such an evil made it unworthy of belief. I expected that every new day would prove the absurdity and falsehood of such claims, but every new day brought more witnesses and more credible evidence, until it was impossible to deny the truth. This rumor was so overwhelming that it consumed and paralyzed the entire soul. Enormous dangers often hold a certain sublimity that can elicit both consternation and pity with a hint of pleasure. Those who are not in peril may experience this feeling. As for myself, I was in no danger and had the leisure to conjure up frightening images and play the roles of those who had suffered through this calamity. This was not a necessity, but rather a pursuit that was ardently recommended by an unknown charm. However, others were not affected in the same way. As the tale was embellished with new incidents and enforced by new testimony, the listeners grew pale, their breath stifled by unease, their blood chilled, and their stomachs bereft of their usual energies. Many experienced temporary indisposition. Some were haunted by a melancholy bordering on madness. Others were attacked by lingering or mortal diseases due to sleepless panics that had no apparent cause and could not be cured by opiates. Mr. Hadwin was not plagued by groundless apprehensions, but his daughters were consumed by the surrounding consternation. The eldest had good reason to be terrified. Her betrothed resided in the city and had left Mr. Hadwin's house a year before to pursue fortune in Philadelphia. He had become a merchant's clerk and, through some successful ventures, began to hope that he could soon support a family. Meanwhile, he maintained a tender and constant correspondence with his beloved Susan. When she first heard of yellow fever, she was overcome with unspeakable perturbation. She wrote to Wallace to ask if it was true, and he initially dismissed it as a vague rumor. Eventually, he reluctantly confessed that there was indeed a pestilential disease in the city, but assured her that it was currently limited to a distant quarter, far from where he resided. Susan pleaded with him to retreat to the countryside, but he insisted on staying until his own street became infected and posed a real danger. He explained the significance of his present employer to his interests, and how persuasive their arguments were in convincing him to remain. However, he vowed that as soon as his situation became even remotely perilous, he would disregard gratitude and self-interest and flee to Malverton. In the meantime, he promised to send updates about his safety whenever possible. Mr. Hadwin's neighbor, Belding, despite sharing in the general panic, continued his daily visits to the city in his market cart. He would set out at sunrise and usually return by noon, faithfully delivering a letter to Susan. As the time of Belding's return approached, Susan's impatience and anxiety grew. She would eagerly receive and read the daily letter, experiencing a momentary relief from her emotions, only for them to intensify the following day at noon. These tumultuous emotions took a toll on Susan's fragile constitution. She persistently pleaded with Wallace to leave the city, while he reassured her of his current safety and pledged to come to her side when the danger became imminent. However, when Belding returned without Wallace but brought a letter from him instead, Susan would succumb to fits of lamentation and weeping. She rejected all attempts at consolation with a stubbornness bordering on madness. It became evident that Wallace's delays were having a detrimental effect on Susan's health. Up until this point, Mr. Hadwin had remained passive in the situation. He thought that his daughter's pleas and arguments would have more sway over Wallace's actions than any words he could utter himself. Despite this, he decided to send a stern letter to the obstinate Wallace, ordering him to return with Belding immediately. The longer Wallace delayed, the more he risked his father-in-law's favor. At this point, the illness had progressed considerably. Belding's concern eventually overcame his reservations, and he embarked on what would be his final journey. This only heightened our eagerness for Wallace's return, as we feared that another suitable mode of transportation might not present itself. Belding set out at dawn, as he always did. During the customary time between his departure and arrival, Susan was racked with hope and fear. As noon approached, her anxiety reached an unbearable level. She could barely be restrained from running down the road towards the city, hoping to meet Belding halfway and learn the fate of her beloved. She stationed herself at a window overlooking the road Belding would take. Her sister and father, though less anxious, also eagerly awaited the sound of the approaching carriage. They caught sight of it as soon as it appeared in the distance. Belding was alone. 
This confirmation of her worst fears caused Susan to collapse into a fit from which she seemed unlikely to recover. This was followed by frenzied episodes of insanity, during which she tried to grab any sharp object within reach in an attempt to end her own life. After these were taken away or wrested from her grasp, she gave herself up to sobs and cries. After questioning Belding, we learned that he had been stationed in his usual spot in the marketplace. Wallace had typically sought him out and exchanged letters, but on this particular morning, the young man had not shown up. Belding had stayed in the city longer than usual in hopes of seeing him, but to no avail. It seemed unlikely that sickness was the cause of his absence. It was difficult to remain optimistic. Wallace had no family or friends in the city. The merchant he worked for had no connection to him beyond business. If he had contracted a contagious illness, it could easily dissolve any ties that bound him to others. Personally, I didn't know Wallace well. I'd only seen his letters, which showed a frank and generous spirit. While not particularly intelligent or refined, he had earned my respect. However, his true importance lay in his relationship with Mr. Hadwin and his place in Susan's heart. His well-being was essential to the happiness of those I cared about. As I observed the daughter's desperate acts of despair and the sister and parent's signs of profound but less intense grief, I couldn't help but wonder if there was anything I could do to alleviate their suffering. Was it not within my power to find out what had become of Wallace? The disease seemed to affect individuals to varying degrees of severity. While the worst form may have been incurable, there were undoubtedly milder forms that could be conquered with the expertise of physicians and the devoted care of nurses. Yet, in its mildest symptoms, neglect and isolation could prove fatal. The thought of Wallace suffering alone during a pandemic haunted me day and night. The desertion of all humanity and the lack of basic necessities such as food and medicine would surely lead to his demise. Until now, I had only considered such misfortunes from afar as a mere fascination for the strange or the sublime. But now, the calamity had entered my own life, and I was consumed with compassion and dread. I found myself unable to enjoy any form of entertainment or work. Instead, I retreated to the gloomy forest or the labyrinthine rocks and valleys, trying to escape the image of Wallace's dying face and the agony of his loved ones. Yet, the idea persisted in my mind. Could I not be the one to help him, to restore his health, and reunite him with his family. I resolved to take action, to risk my own life for the sake of someone in dire need. I would journey to the city, find Wallace's home, and see if he still lived. If he did, I would do all in my power to care for him, to comfort him, and to bring him back to his loved ones. The joy and relief that would follow his return would be worth any danger or sacrifice. Had not the Hadwins been kind and generous to me in the past, did they not deserve my utmost gratitude and loyalty? Surely this was the least I could do to repay them. Admittedly, my own life will be at risk, but the extent of that risk will be directly tied to the length of time I remain in this contaminated environment. The death or escape of Wallace may free me from the need to spend a night in the city. The locals who visit the market each day seem to be immune to this illness, perhaps because they limit their time in the city to a few hours. Could I not follow their example and also avoid the sickness? However, I may need to stay longer than a day. I may be destined to share the same fate as everyone else. Life is full of unknowns and cannot be predicted. My family has a history of early deaths from a disease that cannot be avoided. We are a group of people whose lives are limited to only twenty years due to some inherent trait. We are subject to the same dangers as everyone else, but if we avoid them, we are still destined to die from consumption. So why should I hesitate to sacrifice myself for the greater good? It is better to die knowing that I have made a heroic sacrifice than to die slowly and painfully from nature's cruelty. These thoughts led me to decide to go to the city. Telling the Hadwins about my plans would be pointless and harmful. It would only add to their current worries. Eliza's tenderness and fear, as well as her father's wise concern, would create a thousand obstacles for me to overcome. I would have to listen to their arguments, but I would not be able to refute them. I would only be accused of being reckless and stubborn. But how else could I explain my absence? I had always been truthful and honest. While it is true that there may be no situation that justifies falsehood, in this case, it would be unnecessary and potentially harmful. If I were to disappear without notice, it would give rise to speculation and conjecture, but my true intentions would never be suspected, causing no alarm or fear. My actions would not be seen as guilty, 
but rather as a source of regret that would be alleviated by the belief in my safety and the expectation of my return. However, since my goal is to find Wallace, I would need to be equipped with directions to his whereabouts and a description of his appearance. I easily obtained this information from Mr. Hadwin, who had no reason to suspect the underlying motives behind my inquiries. He provided me with the street name and house number. To my surprise, it was a house that I was already familiar with. It turned out that Wallace resided there with a merchant named Thetford. Could it be possible that I was mistaken? I inquired about the merchant's name, and when I heard Thetford, it confirmed my initial suspicion. I recalled the peculiar circumstances that had led me to enter the house and the bedroom of this gentleman. I also remembered the appearance of the young man who had entangled me in that peculiar and risky situation. Those actions suggested some sort of connection between Thetford and my guide. Wallace, as it turned out, was a member of their family. Could he be the one who had betrayed me? Through further questioning, I obtained a description of Wallace's appearance and demeanor from Hadwin, and every detail pointed to the fact that it was indeed the same person. Wallace, the charming and lively youth I had encountered at Lesher's, was the one who had led me into that romantic and perilous situation, though I had yet to uncover the true motives behind his actions and did not suspect any criminal intent at this point. It was easy to deduce that Wallace's actions stemmed from youthful recklessness and a love of mischief. However, this revelation did not alter my resolution, and armed with the information I needed, I embarked on my journey discreetly. Along the way, my thoughts were occupied with contemplating the potential consequences of my plan, assessing the inconveniences and dangers I would face, bolstering my courage against unsettling sights and sudden changes, and envisioning the appropriate actions to take in any given situation. As these considerations were intertwined with Thetford's family and character, I couldn't help but recall past incidents. I remembered the business connection between Thetford and Welbeck, the references made to Welbeck's predicament during a conversation I overheard in their chamber, and the possible link between these illusions and subsequent events. Welbeck had lost his fortune, which had been entrusted to the care of Thetford's brother. But had the true cause of this loss been fully revealed? Could contraband goods have been smuggled under the management, or with the connivance of the brothers? And might the younger Thetford have acquired the means to purchase the confiscated ship and its cargo, which would typically be sold at a fraction of their actual value in auctions. Unfortunately, Welbeck was no longer alive to benefit from the exposure of this scheme, even if these conclusions proved accurate. My knowledge would be of little use to the world, as I lacked the motivation to disclose the truth. Who would believe my testimony against Thetford, given his seemingly upright character, and perhaps his general integrity? However, it would not be without personal gain for me. The situation with Thetford and his fraudulent activities faded from my mind, replaced by thoughts concerning Clemenza Lodi and the money that had unexpectedly come into my possession. Time had only strengthened my resolve to return the bills to their rightful owner and intensified my eagerness to uncover her whereabouts. I realized that the solutions to achieve this goal were more likely to present themselves at my intended destination than anywhere else. Of course, there was the possibility that I might perish before I could fulfill my intentions, but I had no immediate control over such misfortunes. As long as I remained alive, I would carry the volume containing the bills with me at all times, cherishing its valuable contents. If fate deemed my demise, then a higher power would guide the course of events, just as it did with all other aspects of life. Chapter 14 As I approached the city the signs of its calamitous condition became increasingly evident. Every farmhouse along the way was crowded with additional occupants, people who had fled their homes and now lingered near the road, desperate to glean any news. The number of passengers on the road was significant, as the exodus from the city had not yet ceased. Some walked on foot, their faces marked with recent terror, lost in somber contemplation of their desolate circumstances. Only a few had secured a place of refuge while others lacked the means to pay for food or lodging for the night. Many were uncertain where to seek shelter, as every available space was already overcrowded or doors were closed at their approach. Families, consisting of tearful mothers and frightened children, clung to a few essential belongings as they travelled in various types of vehicles. The loss of a parent or husband had occurred, and the meagre resources obtained from selling possessions or receiving meagre assistance from public charity had been spent on seeking refuge from this disaster-stricken place, 
even though finding accommodation in nearby areas seemed uncertain and hopeless. I overheard conversations between these individuals and other curious onlookers as we travelled along the road. Every person recounted tales of sorrow, each adding new layers of misery. They depicted their own hardships and those of their neighbours, painting vivid images that encompassed the full spectrum of suffering caused by pestilence and poverty. My previous expectations of the severity of the calamity now seemed inadequate. The dangers I was hastening towards appeared more numerous and immediate than I had originally conceived. Nevertheless, my determination remained unwavering. A sense of panic began to creep into my heart, requiring more forceful efforts to subdue and control it. Yet I never harbored a momentary doubt that the path I had chosen was dictated by duty. Proceeding forward held no difficulty or reluctance. The only demand upon my efforts was to traverse this path without chaos or alarm. Various circumstances had impeded my departure, and my frequent pauses to listen to the tales of fellow travellers had further contributed to the delay. By the time I approached the outskirts of the city, the sun was nearing the horizon, casting long shadows upon my path. I followed the familiar route I had taken before and entered High Street after nightfall. Instead of the bustling scene of carriages and crowds that I had observed on my previous visit, filled with laughter and merriment that would typically accompany a mild evening, I found myself immersed in desolate solitude. The once vibrant streets now lay empty and silent. The marketplace in each side of the Grand Avenue was lit up with lamps, just as they had been before. However, between the Squealkill River and the heart of the city, I only encountered a handful of figures. They were ghostly wrapped up in cloaks, and cast suspicious glances my way. As I approached them, they hastily changed their course to avoid contact with me. Their clothes were drenched in vinegar, and they wore strong perfumes to protect themselves from infection. I glanced at the houses that I remembered used to be bustling with activity at this hour. They were now shut tight, both upstairs and downstairs, and gave no indication of being inhabited. Occasionally, a light would flicker in an upper window, revealing that the tenants were still present, but hidden away or unable to leave. These signs were new and filled me with fear. Death seemed to be lurking around every corner, and I worried that I had already been infected by the deadly pestilence. As I stood there trying to calm my nerves, a door suddenly opened, and a hearse came into view. The driver, a black man, was seated on top of it. I watched him carefully, curious about where he was headed. Soon after, Two men emerged from the house, carrying a coffin between them. The driver's companions were white, and their faces showed no sign of emotion or concern. One of them muttered, I'll be damned if I think the poor dog was quite dead. It wasn't the fever that ailed him, but the sight of the girl and her mother on the floor. I wonder how they all got into that room. What brought them here? One man grumbled. Their own two feet, of course. But why should they all huddle together in one room? Another asked. To make things easier for us, of course, the first man replied. I thank them from the bottom of my heart, but damn it all, it wasn't right to put him in his coffin before he was even gone. I swear his last look told me to stay a little longer. Oh, come on now. He couldn't have lived much longer anyway. The sooner he was gone, the better for him and us. Did you see the way he looked at us when we took his wife and daughter away? I've never cried in my life, but I swear I felt like it then. Hey, he suddenly exclaimed, looking up and noticing me a few feet away, listening to their conversation. What do you want? Is someone dead? I didn't bother to answer or argue with them. Instead, I quickly walked away, my joints trembling and cold sweat forming on my forehead. I was ashamed of my own weakness, but I managed to calm down and regain some composure through sheer force of will. It was getting late, and I needed to find a place to stay for the night. I looked for inns with open doors and lit windows, but many of them were empty. Eventually I found one with a sign and knocked for a few minutes. A young girl came to the door looking distressed. Can I help you? She asked. I need a place to stay for the night, I replied. I'm sorry, but both my parents are sick and we can't take in any guests right now. I asked if there were any other inns in the area, but she didn't know of any. She had to leave suddenly when someone called for her from upstairs. I stood there for a moment, feeling embarrassed and unsure of what to do next. Eventually, I wandered aimlessly through the streets until I stumbled upon a large building with a sign that read, Inn. I pounded on the door with great force and persistence. Eventually, 
a woman opened the window on the second floor and spoke to me in an irritable tone, demanding to know what I wanted. I explained that I needed a place to stay. But she dismissed me with a curt response, telling me to search elsewhere. I tried to reason with her, but she abruptly shut the window, leaving me alone with my thoughts. A sense of regret started to wash over me regarding my decision to embark on this journey. Never before had I felt such profound loneliness, even in the depths of caverns or forests. I was surrounded by human dwellings, yet devoid of companionship or friendship. I had money, but it could not secure me a place to shelter or a morsel of food. I had come intending to provide relief to others, yet now I found myself in desperate need of assistance. My situation was already dire, but the possibility of contracting a deadly illness made it even more perilous. It was unreasonable to hope that someone would provide refuge for a sick man when they had denied it to a healthy one. My initial instinct was to turn back and return to Malverton as quickly as possible. I felt a sense of urgency, as though the disease was chasing me and I needed to outrun it. However, I quickly realized the foolishness of my panic. I thought of Susan Hadwin and Wallace, and reminded myself of the reasons why I had set out on this journey in the first place. My determination had not wavered, and I was so close to achieving my goal. Thetford's home was just a few steps away and I knew that my help could make all the difference in the world. I had originally decided to delay my visit to Thetford's house until the following morning, but I questioned why I should wait. Perhaps circumstances would allow me to leave the city early if I at least took a look at the house from the outside. I could accomplish everything I had come for, determine Wallace's fate, and return to Malverton safely before daybreak. I immediately made my way towards Thetford's dwelling. As I walked, I noticed numerous carriages carrying the dead, and a few hurried passengers who were clearly affected by the tragedy. Thetford's house soon came into view, and a light in one of the upper windows indicated that it was still occupied. I paused to consider my next move. My goal was to confirm the existence and status of Wallace, who had lived in this house. I hesitated to enter, fearing that I might unknowingly put myself in danger. Most of the nearby houses appeared to be abandoned, but there were signs of life in some of them. Perhaps I could ask someone about Thetford's family without disturbing them at such a late hour. However, I realized that knocking on Thetford's door and asking whoever answered about Wallace was the most straightforward approach. I knocked hesitantly at first, but there was no answer. I knocked again, louder this time, and rang the bell. I could hear the faint sound of the bell ringing in the distance. If anyone was inside, they would have heard it. I waited and listened, but there was no response. Although the light was visible through the window curtains, there was no sign of movement or sound. I pondered the reasons why my signal had not been answered. In my mind, there was nothing but the helplessness of disease or the insensibility of death. These thoughts only pushed me to persist in my efforts to gain entry. Without considering the consequences, I instinctively lifted the latch. The door opened easily, and I stepped into the hallway. I paused once more. The hallway was quite long, and I could see light at the end, as if from a lamp or candle. This urged me to continue forward until I reached the bottom of the staircase. A candle was placed on the lowest step, indicating that the house was not abandoned. I tapped my foot loudly on the ground, hoping to grab someone's attention, but my efforts were in vain. However, having come this far, it would be foolish to turn back now. I picked up the candle and opened a nearby door which led to a spacious and lavishly furnished sitting room. I walked around, admiring the objects on display, but I knocked with my foot even louder than before, yet still no one responded. Despite the lights I had seen, it was still possible that the house was unoccupied. I was determined to find out the truth by proceeding to the illuminated chamber that I had seen from outside. I believed that this chamber was the same one that I had stayed in on my first night in the city. Now, for the second time, I was in a state of almost complete ignorance about my situation and the impending consequences as I made my way to the same room. As I climbed the stairs, a deadly and infectious vapor overcame my senses, unlike anything I had ever experienced before. I had encountered many foul odors since my arrival in the city, some even more unbearable than this. It felt as though I didn't just smell the air, but rather tasted it as if I had ingested a poisonous and insidious substance that instantly drained all strength from my stomach. It seemed as if some fatal force had taken hold of my vital organs, 
initiating a process of decay and decomposition. For a moment, I entertained the possibility that my sensations were products of my imagination, but I had not been previously overcome with panic. Even now, I observed my own feelings without mental distress. There was no question that I had contracted the disease. The odds were now stacked against me. The dice of sickness had been cast. Whether my condition would be mild or severe, whether I would recover or perish, was solely in the hands of the future. Rather than filling me with terror, this realization served to bolster my courage. The danger I had feared had arrived. I could now enter this realm of pestilence without hesitation. I could carry out my duties, whatever they may be, without faltering. My situation was no longer precarious, and my destiny would be unaffected by my future actions. The initial pang and momentary urge to vomit subsided. Although I didn't regain a sense of well-being, I regained the strength to continue. As I neared the chamber door, the noxious fumes grew stronger. The door stood slightly ajar, allowing a faint light to escape. My assumption that those inside were lifeless was quickly proven wrong, as I heard sounds that resembled hurried and cautious footsteps across the floor. The footsteps ceased, replaced by other inexplicable noises. Stepping into the room, I noticed a solitary candle casting a dim glow on the hearth. The table before me was cluttered with vials and medical instruments commonly found in a sick room. As I surveyed the chamber, my gaze fixated on a bed situated to one side, its curtains drawn at the foot, concealing whoever lay within. It was evident that someone occupied the bed, given the sporadic breaths taken at long intervals, barely audible mutterings, and the trembling motion of the bed frame. If my heart quivered, it was not out of self-concern. Only Wallace, the sole purpose of my quest, occupied my thoughts. The memories of the Hadwin family, their past agonies, and the impending despair that would engulf Susan upon learning of her lover's demise swirled in my mind. The desolation of this house, indicating a lack of proper care for the sick, coupled with the evident symptoms of impending death, weighed heavily upon me causing a heartache more unbearable than the recent physical affliction I had endured. My imagination painted a vivid picture of the tragedy unfolding before me. Wallace, the first victim of the family to succumb to the pestilence, had been left behind as Thetford fled their home. Perhaps it was a father and husband's duty to escape the perils that awaited, a decision guided by self-preservation. It was undoubtedly the choice dictated by selfish motives. Wallace was left to perish in solitude, or worse, he had been entrusted to callous and mercenary attendants, who had now abandoned him in this desperate hour. While I acknowledged the possibility that these assumptions, however plausible, might be false, my flickering hope urged me to steal a glance at the dying man. Driven by this purpose, I cautiously approached the bed and pushed my head past the curtain. The features of someone as fleeting as Wallace would not be easily recognizable, especially when marred by the tremors of impending death. Yet the distinctions in front of me were too striking to deceive. I beheld a countenance that bore no resemblance to the one I had seen before. Despite its ghastly and pallid appearance, the marks of intelligence and beauty remained unblemished. Wallace's life held great significance to an individual like myself, but surely the being lying before me, on the precipice of his last breath, was precious to countless others. Was he not someone for whom I would willingly have sacrificed myself? However, the offering came too late. His limbs had already grown cold. A noxious and contagious vapor hung over him, and the faint beats of his pulse had ceased. His existence was fading away amidst convulsions and agonies. Reluctantly, I averted my gaze from this sight and turned towards a nearby table, my actions almost unconscious. My mind was consumed by contemplations of the chain of horrors and misfortunes that plague humanity. But my thoughts were abruptly interrupted, when I noticed a small cabinet, its hinges broken, and the lid partially open. In my current state of mind, I was inclined to suspect the worst. It seemed to bear the traces of plunder, suggesting that some opportunistic or callous attendant had not only hastened the patient's demise, but also pilfered his belongings before fleeing. Perhaps this suspicion would have yielded to more rational thinking given enough time for reflection. However, I was not granted such a luxury. A mere moment passed when something in the mirror hanging above the table caught my attention. It was the reflection of a human figure. The glimpse I caught of this apparition was fleeting, yet it was enough to allow the vague notion to arise that the dying man had risen from his bed and was approaching me. 
However, this belief was instantly disproven as I took in the figure's form and attire. As I turned to face him, my heart quickened with fear. The man before me was a terrifying sight to behold. His tawny skin and grotesquely misproportioned form were only accentuated by the scar upon his cheek and the singular eye that stared back at me. He was dressed in livery and stood with the brawn of Hercules. I was frozen with terror, unable to discern whether to flee or confront this apparition. In a flash he struck me with a blow to my temple. My consciousness faded, and I collapsed onto the floor, senseless. Though I was unconscious, my mind was plagued by a haunting dream. I found myself bound and at the mercy of two grim and gigantic figures who intended to cast me into an abyss. My terror was palpable as I struggled against my restraints with all my might. Suddenly my bonds snapped, and I was free. When I awoke, I was surrounded by three men, one of whom held a hammer and nails. A pine coffin lay open on the ground beside them. As I tried to stand, my head spun, and my vision blurred. With the help of one of the men, I regained my feet, and the fog cleared from my mind. My confusion vanished, and I was soon able to stand and move without any assistance. I once again turned my gaze towards my companions, and recognized the three men whom I had encountered on High Street, the same individuals whose conversation I had overheard. My eyes then shifted back to the coffin, and fragments of memory regarding the events that led me to this moment, including the powerful blow I had received, resurfaced in my mind. I realized the mistaken assumptions these men had made about me, and shuddered to think how narrowly I had escaped being buried alive. Before the men could inquire or comment on my peculiar situation, another person entered the room, whose appearance and demeanor provided me with a glimmer of hope. This stranger exuded a sense of calmness and kindness, with a countenance that combined the seriousness of age with the smoothness and rosy hue of youth. His attire indicated his affiliation with a religious order, which resonated with the benevolent principles exemplified by Hadwin. Upon noticing me standing, he displayed a mixture of surprise and satisfaction. In a gentle tone he addressed me, Young man, what is your condition? Are you sick? If so, you must agree to receive the best available treatment at these times. These men will escort you to the hospital at Bush Hill. The mention of that dreaded and contagious institution stirred a newfound determination within me. No, I replied, I am not sick. It was a severe blow that brought me to this state. I will soon regain enough strength to leave this place without assistance. He regarded me with a skeptical yet compassionate expression. I fear you may be deceiving yourself or me. Although going to the hospital is regrettable, it may be the best course of action. Perhaps you have relatives or friends who can take care of you. No, I confessed. I have neither relatives nor friends. I am a stranger in this city. I do not even know a single being, I replied despondently. Alas, the stranger sighed, your state is sorrowful. But how did you end up here? he inquired, looking around the room. And where do you come from? I came from the countryside. I arrived in the city a few hours ago. I was searching for a friend who lived in this house. Your undertaking was remarkably hazardous and reckless, he commented. But who is this friend you seek? Was it the person who died in that bed? whose body has just been taken away. The men grew impatient and asked Mr. Estwick, as they called him, what they should do. He turned to me and asked if I would be willing to be taken to the hospital. I assured him that I was not afflicted with any illness and did not require assistance. I explained that my weakness was due to a severe blow I received from a ruffian on my temple. The visible marks of the blow seemed to confirm my explanation, and after some hesitation, he dismissed the men who lifted the empty coffin onto their shoulders, and departed. He then invited me to descend to the parlour, stating, The air in this room is deadly. I already feel as if I may regret having entered. Once in the parlour, he inquired about the circumstances that led to the scene he witnessed. I explained my situation as clearly and concisely as I could. After pondering my story in silence, he spoke again. I see how it is, he said. The person you saw in the throes of death was a stranger. He was attended by his servant and a hired nurse. Once his master's death was inevitable, the nurse was sent by the servant to fetch a coffin. It seems the servant took advantage of that moment to search his master's trunk, which was on the table. Your untimely entrance disrupted his plans, and he intended to incapacitate you with the blow he delivered, so he could make his escape before the hearse arrived. 
I know the man, and the apparition you have described so well was indeed his. You mentioned that a friend of yours lived in this house, but you have come too late to be of any help. The entire family has perished. None of them were allowed to escape. Upon hearing this devastating news, my hopes were shattered. I struggled to control my emotions, and tears of compassion welled up not only for Wallace, but also for Thetford, his father, his wife, and his child. I felt ashamed of my seemingly futile and childish sensitivity, and attempted to apologize to the stranger. However, it seemed that my sympathy had touched him as well, and he turned away to hide his own tears. No, he said in response to my apologies. There is no need to be ashamed of your emotions. Merely knowing this family and witnessing their deplorable fate is enough to melt even the most hardened heart. I suspect that you had a connection to someone in this family, similar to the ties of affection that brought the unfortunate Maravegli here. His mention of Maravegli piqued my curiosity, although I was uncertain of its relevance to myself. I inquired about the character and circumstances of this person and, more specifically, their connection to the family. Maravegli, he replied, was the lover of the eldest daughter and already engaged to marry her. The entire family, consisting of vulnerable women, had entrusted themselves to his care. Mary Walpole and her children found in him both a husband and a father. The name Walpole, unfamiliar to me, raised doubts that I promptly expressed. I am not searching for a female friend, although I do care about Thetford and his family's well-being. My main concern is for a young man named Wallace. He looked at me with surprise. Thetford? This is not his residence. He moved to a different place several weeks before the fever outbreak. The former occupants of this house were an English woman and her seven daughters, I was informed. The revelation of my mistake provided some consolation. Perhaps Wallace was still alive and safe. I eagerly asked where Thetford had gone and if he had any knowledge of Wallace's current state. He told me that Thetford had moved to Market Street, but as for his well-being, my informant knew nothing. He had only a passing acquaintance with Thetford, and was uninformed about whether he had left the city or remained. It was up to me to find out the truth. As I prepared to thank the person who had saved me from being buried alive, as he had stopped the hearse attendants from sealing me in a coffin, he expressed doubt about my true condition. He ordered a delay of twenty minutes and administered some medical treatment to determine if I was dead or alive. Luckily, my senses returned after that time had passed. When I told him I was leaving... He questioned my intentions. I explained that I was going to try to find out what had happened to my friend Wallace. The man warned me that my plan was unwise and reckless. He advised me to rest and recover from my recent injury before attempting to assist others. He suggested that instead of wandering the streets and breathing in the unhealthy air, I should find a bed and try to sleep. In the morning I would be better equipped to help my friend. Although I agreed with his advice, I was unsure where to find a room to rest in. I doubted trying to secure lodgings at an inn would be any more successful than my previous attempts. Your situation is sad, he acknowledged. I do not possess a home to which I can lead you. I share my room and even my bed with another, and my landlady refused to allow a stranger. I am unsure of what to do. This house is defenseless. The previous owner purchased and furnished it. But the entire family, including the mistress, children and servants, perished in a single week. It is possible that no one in America can claim ownership of the property. In the meantime, looters are abundant and active. I am afraid that this entirely deserted house, filled with valuable furniture, will become their target. There is nothing that can be done tonight to secure it, except to stay in it. Would you be willing to remain here until tomorrow? Every bed in the house has probably been occupied by a deceased person. It would be improper to sleep in any of them. You may find some rest on this carpet. It is at least better than the hard pavement and the open air. I accepted this proposal after some hesitation. He was preparing to leave, promising to return early in the morning if he survived. My curiosity about the person whose dying moments I had witnessed led me to detain him for a few moments. Ah, he exclaimed, perhaps this is the only victim of this epidemic, whose loss future generations may have reason to lament. He was the only descendant of a noble Venetian family. From a young age he was devoted to acquiring knowledge and practicing virtue. He came here as an enlightened observer, and after traveling around the country, conversing with the most talented and influential people, and collecting a wealth of observations whose solidity and fairness have rarely been matched, he embarked on a voyage to Europe three months ago. 
Before his departure, he formed a deep connection with the eldest daughter of this family. The mother and her children had recently arrived from England. I had never encountered such faultless women, both in terms of their mental and physical qualities before. This young man, Wallace, was truly deserving of being embraced into this family. He had planned to return as quickly as possible to his homeland, to settle his affairs, and then hurry back to America to finalize his engagement with Fanny Walpole. However, the ship he boarded was struck by a storm just twenty leagues out to sea, forcing it to return to port. He traveled to New York to secure passage on a different vessel, but by that time, the illness had begun to spread among us. Mary Walpole, due to her lack of understanding about the nature of the disease and the misguided advice of well-meaning friends, hesitated to flee until it was too late. Her death added to the family's helplessness and despair. They were successively struck down by the same pestilence. Maravigli, aware of their peril, allowed the packet ship to depart without him and rushed to save the Walpole family from the encroaching danger. He arrived in the city just in time to witness the burial of the last surviving member. But at that very hour, he himself was seized by the illness, and his fate is known to you, the stranger explained. With that, he informed me that he would leave me to rest, as sleep was necessary not only for me but for himself as well, as he had gone two consecutive nights without it. After bidding me farewell, he departed, and I was left to contemplate my situation. Despite the opportunity for rest, I found no inclination to sleep. Though I lay down for a brief moment, my discomfort and restless thoughts prevented any true rest. Before entering this house, hunger tormented me, but now it had been replaced by unease and a loss of appetite. I paced the room with a mixture of deep thought and anxiousness, trying to make sense of the events that had unfolded. As I sat and pondered over the tales told by Estwick, I couldn't help but think about the devastating effects of the pestilence. The gruesome realities of the situation were overwhelming. Comparing my current experience to the idyllic scenes of Malverton, I couldn't help but wonder about the stark contrast between city and country life. It only strengthened my resolve to avoid such dens of iniquity and danger. Despite my certainty about my own fate, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The new sensations in my stomach were a clear indication that I had been infected by the noxious poison. Whether I lived or died was a foregone conclusion. Negligence and solitude would only serve to exacerbate the sickness, rendering it fatal. But who was there to provide me with medical or friendly care? The roof over my head was no guarantee of safety. My sickness would be discovered and I would be carted off to the hospital, where death was inevitable but the solitude and silence I craved would be absent. The only music would be the dying groans of others, and the only sight, the livid corpses of the afflicted. Lost in these bleak thoughts, the night slowly passed into day. The first light of dawn filtering through the window brought with it a faint glimmer of hope. Contrary to my expectations, my feelings were not as disordered as I had anticipated, despite the lack of sleep. Perhaps this was a sign that my condition was not as dire as I had feared. Maybe this was the worst of it. As I waited impatiently for Estwick's arrival, the morning progressed without any sign of him. I couldn't help but recall his words about regretting his visit. Maybe he too had fallen ill, causing the delay. The benevolence of this man had won over my affections. If I knew his whereabouts, I would have hurried to wherever he was to inquire about his well-being and carry out any task that compassion might dictate. However, he had not disclosed any details on that matter. Chapter 15 it was my duty to locate Thetford's dwelling. Leaving the house open for anyone to enter was not wise. Without a key, I secured the main entrance with a bolt and climbed out a window. Although I couldn't lock it, I closed the shutters behind me. This led me to a large courtyard, and at the end was a brick wall that I jumped over to reach the street. This was how I had previously escaped from the same area. The streets were deserted as I walked. Two-thirds of the population had fled, leaving the city almost entirely empty. The closed houses were likely due to the lack of commerce and fear of infection, causing people to hide from one another. I searched for the house where Thetford resided, as Estwick had directed me. I was shocked to find it was the same house where I had overheard the conversation the previous evening. I remembered the scene the gravediggers had described. If the wealthy and well-connected master of the household had met such a fate, what hope did the poor and friendless Wallace have? The house appeared unoccupied and silent, 
but appearances could be deceiving. Hope was scarce, but certainty was what I needed. The answers I sought might be found within the walls of the house. Perhaps someone inside could provide the information I so desperately needed, and my presence could bring relief from both pestilence and famine. For a moment, I forgot my own dire circumstances, and didn't consider the toll that abstinence had already taken on my body. I knocked on the door, but my signal went unnoticed. I opened the unlocked door and stepped inside. As I did, I noticed another door nearby that opened, and a man emerged from a house down the way. The man was old, but exuded an air of calmness and bravery. He had likely seen my behavior through a window and had come out to investigate. He greeted me courteously and asked how he could help me. I mentioned Thetford's name and expressed my concern that he had fallen victim to the plague. The man confirmed my fears, explaining that Thetford, his wife and his child, had been in a hopeless condition the previous day. He had expected them to pass away during the night, but when he returned in the morning, the house was empty. He presumed they had died and been taken away. Although I was desperate to know the fate of Wallace, I didn't want to ask directly. The thought of what might have happened made me shudder, but I couldn't ignore my curiosity. Why? I asked, my voice faltering. Did he not timely withdraw from the city? Surely he had the means to secure refuge in the countryside. I can hardly explain, he replied. Some sort of infatuation seemed to have taken hold of him. Despite being one of the most fearful individuals, he strangely believed that he would remain safe as long as he avoided contact with those infected. I suspect his self-interest also played a part in his decision. His departure would have had no more negative impact on his affairs than it did on others. But in his eyes, personal gain outweighed everything else. He did have intentions to eventually withdraw, but his successful escape today gave him newfound courage to face the perils of tomorrow. He kept postponing his departure day after day until it became impossible. What about his family? I inquired. Were they numerous, extending beyond his wife and children? Perhaps they managed to leave in time? Yes, he responded. His father left the house early on. One or two of the servants also abandoned him. However, there was one girl, more loyal and valiant than the rest, who defied the objections of her parents and friends. She made a firm decision to stand by him through every circumstance. She anxiously urged the family to flee from danger and would have willingly accompanied them. But as long as they chose to stay, it was her unwavering resolution not to abandon them. Unfortunately, poor girl. She did not comprehend the true nature of Thetford's heart. Sadly, she was the first to fall ill. I doubt whether her illness was pestilential. It was likely a minor ailment that would have either naturally vanished in a few days or responded well to appropriate treatment. Thetford was petrified with terror. Instead of summoning a physician to determine the nature of her symptoms, he called for a cart and a black servant from Bush Hill. Despite the pleading of concerned neighbours and the girl herself, who insisted her condition was mild, Thetford remained unmoved. She pleaded with him, urging him to allow her to send for her mother, who lived a few miles away in the countryside. Her mother would rush to her aid, relieving him and his family from the burden of caring for her. The man was driven mad by fear. He dismissed her pleas, even though they were delivered in a manner that could have melted the hardest heart. The girl, innocent, kind and brave, had an unconquerable dread of the hospital. Failing to persuade him, she summoned all her strength to resist the man who forcibly lifted her into the cart. Realizing her struggles were futile, she surrendered to despair. Believing that she was being led to certain death and subjected to the cruelties inflicted by the heartless attendants of the hospital, she suffered immensely. This state of mind, combined with the exposure to the scorching noon sun during the mile-long journey over rough pavement, was enough to seal her fate. It came as no surprise when I learned that she passed away the following day. This act alone was reprehensible, yet it was not the most heinous deed committed by this man. His clerk, a young man who appeared to have his trust and was treated as a member of the family, fell ill the subsequent night and was subjected to the same treatment. These words struck me deeply. Indignation and sorrow welled up within me, nearly overwhelming my composure. With great effort I managed to ask, Whom do you speak of, sir? What was the name of this youth? His name was Wallace. I sense that you hold some interest in his fate, he replied. He was someone I held dear. I would have gladly given up half my fortune to secure him shelter under a compassionate roof, I explained. 
His illness was severe, but with proper care, there was a chance for his recovery. To expect his survival after being taken to the hospital and subjected to its treatment would have been futile. Thetford's actions were as absurd as they were wicked. His belief in the contagious nature of the disease was the pinnacle of folly, and his notion that he was safe simply by not allowing a sick man to remain in his house was equally foolish. Fear had distorted Thetford's reasoning. He remained impervious to arguments and pleas, his focus fixed on a single object. Attempting to sway him with words was akin to reasoning with the deaf. Perhaps the wretch deserved more pity than hatred. The victims of his relentless caution could hardly have endured greater suffering than the anguish his cowardice inflicted upon himself. Regardless of the extent of his guilt, retribution came in full force. He witnessed the death of his wife and child, and last night marked the end of his own existence. Their sole attendant was a black woman, whom I attempted with little success to urge into diligent care through frequent visits. Such, then, was the tragic fate of Wallace. The purpose of my journey to this place has been fulfilled. His destiny has been revealed. And now all that remains is to fulfill the somber predictions of the lovely yet unfortunate Susan. Revealing the full truth to her would only intensify her grief unnecessarily. With time, aided by the tenderness and sympathy of friendship, her despair may subside, leaving her with nothing but the lingering sorrows of melancholy. After clearing my mind of these thoughts, I briefly explained to my companion the reasons for my visit to the city and my curiosity about Thetford. He inquired about the details of my journey and the timing of my arrival. When I told him that I had arrived the previous evening and had since gone without sleep or food, he expressed both astonishment and compassion. Your endeavor has undoubtedly been risky, he remarked. Every breath you take is poisoned, and it's only getting worse with each moment you go without food or rest. My advice? Get out of the city as soon as possible, but not before you get some rest and nourishment. If you leave before nightfall and make your way past Squealkill, you should be fine, he added. But I knew finding a place to stay on the road would be difficult. It would be best to time my journey so that I arrive in Malverton at night. As for food and sleep... They weren't exactly up for sale in the city. True, my companion replied, quick as a whip. You can't buy them, but I can give you all the food and rest you need for free. That's my home over there, he gestured to the house he had just left. I live with a widow and her daughter. They took my advice and fled the city in time. I stayed behind to watch and learn, with only my faithful servant Austin to tend to me. If I get sick, I'll take care of myself. But if I need a nurse, Austin will be there for me. His words were kind, and his face was open. I couldn't help but accept his invitation, not just for the food and sleep, but because I didn't want to leave the company of someone so brave and virtuous. His home was clean and well-stocked, and Austin was both skilled and obedient. My companion, Medlicott, was a talker, and he spoke on the state of the city as if he had read every book and lived through every experience. He disputed my casual notion about the origin of the epidemic, attributing it not to infected substances from the east or west, but rather to a sickly state of the atmosphere caused by dirty streets, cramped homes, and unsanitary individuals. As we conversed, my sense of danger faded, and I felt a renewed sense of confidence and vigor. Though still unwell, I was less uncomfortable and didn't require rest. After breakfast, my companion left to attend to his daily affairs, advising me to rest, but I knew I couldn't sleep. I was eager to escape the contaminated air, and wondered if there was anything left to do regarding Wallace. I realized he must have left behind some belongings, such as clothes, papers, and books, which now belonged to the Hadwins. I considered myself their representative, and wondered if I could obtain possession, or at least secure these items. The house and its contents were unprotected, and could easily be looted by desperate criminals, or even by Thetford's unknown successor or heir. I was lost in thought and indecision, until someone knocked at the door. Austin answered and returned with Mr. Hadwin, which surprised and saddened me. I knew why he had come. The trip was pointless, for the man he sought was deceased. I had taken it upon myself to find out what had happened to him. It was now clear to me that my decision to keep my journey a secret from my employer was a grave mistake. He had unknowingly put himself in harm's way by going into the city, risking his own life and the lives of his loved ones. If only I had been honest with him, he would have surely approved of my plan. But my foolishness led me down this path of secrecy. While secrecy may at times be necessary, it is always misguided and harmful. 
Mr. Hadwin was just as surprised to see me as I was to see him. We both explained the reasons for our unexpected encounter. He had come to the city to try and find out what had happened to Wallace, to ease his child's suffering. He had hoped to hire someone to do the dangerous task for him, but had been unsuccessful. So he had decided to take matters into his own hands. He knew that Thetford had moved to this street, but had not mentioned it to me during our last conversation because he didn't know about my plans. I was acutely aware of the danger he was in by being in the city. Knowing how much his daughters depended on him for their happiness made me all the more anxious for his safety. The longer he stayed, the greater the risk. There was no reason for him to delay any further. Neither Wallace nor I could benefit from his presence. I told him about his nephew's death, hoping to convince him to leave as soon as possible. I implored him with great urgency to mount his horse and flee. I made it clear that I did not want him to ask any questions about Wallace or me, and promised to follow him promptly and provide him with all the answers he needed once we reached Malverton. He was frightened, and after a brief hesitation he rode off. The incident left me in a highly agitated state. My already fragile condition worsened considerably. I knew that my visit to Maravegli's chamber was responsible for this, but this was the price of my secrecy. I was accustomed to travelling by foot, which was fine in normal circumstances, but not now. Had Hadwin known my intentions, he would have allowed me to use one of his horses. I consoled myself with the knowledge that my actions were motivated by benevolence and a desire to help others in the best way I knew how. But what was my next course of action? It was unthinkable to leave Wallace's affairs unattended. I could entrust his belongings to my newfound ally, but how would I identify them? They were likely contained in labelled trunks, but I had no idea where to look for them. Undeterred, I decided to return to Thetford's house and search for clues that might lead me to Wallace's possessions. I regretted not seeking the counsel or presence of my new friend, but he departed after breakfast, citing unspecified engagements. I roamed aimlessly through the abandoned mansion, the stench of pestilence permeating the air. In the front room of the second floor, I detected signs of the previous night's calamity. The bed appeared to have been disturbed, bearing the telltale yellow stains of the disease's characteristic gangrenous or black vomit. Similar stains marred the floor. Some may deem my actions reckless or heroic, but I remain perplexed by my own conduct. Though death is not always to be feared, the dangers of pestilence, shrouded in mystery, are the most ominous. Only nurses and physicians become desensitized to such horrors. The rest of us recoil in disgust and fear. I was not sustained by confidence in my safety or by habit, but by the conviction that this was as good a path to death as any other, and that one's duty sometimes requires the sacrifice of life. I moved from one room to another, eventually noticing a portmanteau bearing the initials of Wallace's name. This led me to believe that he had occupied the room, which was neat and tidy, with trunks and drawers. The object I mentioned earlier was the only one that bore the marks of Wallace's ownership. I lifted it in my arms, intending to take it to Medlicott's house. At that moment, I thought I heard a slow and lingering footstep ascending the stairs. This occurrence unsettled me. The footstep had an eerie solemnity and slowness to it. The apparition vanished quickly, replaced by more mundane possibilities. A human being approached, their purpose and authority unknown. It was easy to imagine that we were strangers to each other, but how would my presence in this secluded chamber, carrying someone else's belongings, be interpreted? Had this person entered the house after me, or were they a tenant of a previously unvisited room who had been awakened by my arrival? In my state of confusion, I still held the item aloft. The logical course of action would have been to place it on the floor and face this visitor without this ambiguous token. Only time would reveal whether these footsteps were heading toward this particular room or another. My doubts were quickly dispelled. The door opened and a figure glided in. The portmanteau slipped from my arms and my heart ran cold. If the possibility of encountering a specter of the deceased existed, and I could not deny that possibility... This was precisely such an apparition. A yellowish and livid hue, fleshless bones, hollow and sorrowful eyes fixed in an expression of bewildered agony upon me, and disheveled and neglected hair formed the image that stood before me. My belief in something supernatural about this apparition was confirmed, as I recalled the resemblance between these features and those of someone who was dead. In this ethereal and deathly appearance, I unmistakably recognized the features of Wallace, 
the same person who had deceived my naive innocence during my initial visit to this city, and whose demise I had believed to be unquestionably confirmed. Initially, I was filled with superstition upon recognizing the figure before me. Wallace had been taken to the hospital, and it seemed impossible that he could have returned from that dreadful place alive. Yet, here he stood, having risen from the brink of death. The crisis of his illness had passed, and he was once again among the living. This news filled me with immense joy, despite the doubts that may arise from our meeting. I forgot the past betrayals and the potential difficulties that may arise from our encounters. Instead, I focused solely on the happiness that his recovery would bring to his uncle and cousins. I approached him with congratulations and offered my hand, but he recoiled and asked, Who are you? What do you want? I explained that I was a friend of Wallace's, a messenger from his family in Malverton. I had come to inquire about his silence and offer any assistance that I could. He still regarded me with suspicion and doubt, but I attempted to alleviate his concerns by explaining my motives. It took some convincing, but he eventually believed me and asked about his family with great concern and tenderness. He hoped they were unaware of his condition, but I could not offer him false hope. I regretted my initial assumption of his death and the pain it must have caused his loved ones. Without stating the reasons behind my belief, I had confidently expressed it to Mr. Hadwin. These tidings would reach his daughters, exacerbating their grief to a deplorable and potentially fatal extent. There was only one way to remedy or evade this harm. News of Wallace's recovery had to be conveyed to them. But where could I find a messenger? Everyone's attention was absorbed by their own concerns. Those who were able or willing to leave the city had their own motives for doing so. If a vehicle or horse could be obtained with money, should it not be secured for Wallace himself, who needed the easiest and fastest means of departing from this realm of death? Wallace was feeble both in body and mind, seemingly incapable of contemplating escape from the difficulties surrounding him. Once he had regained sufficient strength, he had left the hospital. Prudence dictated that he should go to Malverton, but he despaired of accomplishing it. The city was nearby, his usual place of residence and his faltering steps involuntarily led him here. He listened to my advice and recognized its soundness. He entrusted himself to my protection and guidance, pledging to follow my instructions implicitly. His strength had carried him this far, but it was now completely depleted. The task of searching for a carriage and horse fell upon me. To accomplish this, I had to rely on my own resourcefulness and diligence. Although Wallace had been a long-time resident of the city, he was unaware of whom I could approach or which establishments offered carriages for hire. Through my own reflections, I concluded that innkeepers were most likely to provide such accommodations, or at least guide me in the right direction. With a firm determination to begin my search immediately, I instructed Wallace to take refuge in Medlicott's apartments, with the help of Austin, while making preparations for his journey. The morning sun beat down on me with a sickening intensity, unlike anything I had ever experienced before. The prolonged drought had left the air and earth devoid of any moisture, and the very air I breathed seemed to have turned toxic. I was surprised at the sudden weakness that had overtaken me. My mind and body felt numb and restless. But I knew that I could not let this weakness deter me from the task at hand. I refused to succumb to this ignoble fate, and instead summoned all my strength and willpower. I reminded myself that the source of all energy and life was within me, and that nothing was impossible if I put my mind to it. I fought against the dreariness that threatened to pull me down and instead quickened my pace, lifted my drooping eyelids, and hummed a cheerful tune. I knew that I owed all my success that day to the strength and fervor of my resolutions. I went from one tavern to another, determined to leave no stone unturned in my search. Some were deserted, others were filled with sick people who refused to listen to my inquiries, and yet others had their horses already engaged but I refused to give up and continued my search, despite the constant disappointments and setbacks. To recount all the events of that expedition, the arguments and supplications I used to overcome greed and fear, and the ups and downs of my hopes would be pointless. After exhausting all of my options without success, I found myself once again heading to Medlicott's lodgings. The present circumstances of my situation weighed heavily on my mind as I pondered my next move. The initial plan was impractical, so I began to consider other options. Wallace was too weak to make the journey on foot, but perhaps he could manage to make it beyond Squillkill with his strength and determination. 
While a carriage or horse was not available in the city, they could be easily procured from a farmer in the countryside. Hiring a beast for half a day would not be too costly. This new plan seemed practical and promising, and I regretted the wasted time and effort on the previous plan. However, dwelling on my regret would only prolong the misfortune caused by the previous plan. I was hopeful that I would have the time and energy to execute this new plan. As I entered Medlicott's house, I tried to appear confident despite my fatigue. Wallace, however, was quick to lose hope upon learning of the previous plan's failure. He was not pleased to hear my new plan, insisting that he was too weak to move from his current location. I tried to encourage him, suggesting that the fresh country air would invigorate him and that we could rest frequently along the way. Even if we were unable to find lodging, we could at least find shelter in a barn and nourish ourselves with fresh eggs. The idea of staying in the city any longer filled us with dread, but we knew that the worst treatment outside of it was still better than staying put. Eventually, he agreed to put his abilities to the test, but only after getting some rest. Reluctantly, I consented to the break. During this time, he reflected on the past and asked about Thetford and his family. When I told him what Medlicott had informed me of, he seemed more satisfied than regretful. The cruelty he had experienced had left him with nothing but hatred and a desire for revenge. I took advantage of the break to learn more about Thetford. I asked Wallace why he had ignored the advice of his uncle and cousin and put himself in so much danger. I can't justify my behavior, he replied. It was foolish and stubborn. I was confident and unconcerned as long as our neighborhood was free of the disease and I didn't have any contact with the sick. But if Thetford hadn't used his most persuasive arguments to keep me, I would have gone to Malverton just to please my friends. He tried to downplay the danger and said to me, Why leave when my family and I are staying? If the danger were imminent, do you think we would still be here? When we leave, you'll come with us. I need your help with my affairs right now. And if you stay, I'll double your salary next year. That will allow you to marry your cousin right away. It is truly unlikely that any of us will fall ill. But if such an unfortunate event should befall you, I assure you that you will receive the utmost care and attention. He continued. My heart's desire was to make Susan Hadwin my wife, and I had worked tirelessly towards this goal. Staying put would hasten this desirable outcome and pose little risk, while leaving would jeopardize Thetford's affections for me. I must acknowledge that until then, he had treated me with unparalleled kindness and generosity. Leaving would also ruin all my plans of becoming wealthy. My determination was not unwavering. Every time a letter arrived from Malverton I was tempted to leave, but each time Thetford would offer new arguments and plead with me to stay. I was in a state of constant indecision. It was during this state of flux that the girl who nursed Mrs. Thetford's infant fell ill. She was a remarkable person who deserved much better than the treatment she received. Like me, she refused to leave, but her reasons were selfless and heroic. As soon as her illness became apparent, she was taken to the hospital. I realized then that I could not rely on Thetford's assurances. His fear of death had overridden all other considerations. After the girl's departure, he consoled himself with her assurances that she did not have the fever, even though he knew that it was he who had led her to her death. Now I was greatly alarmed for my own safety. I was determined to face his anger and refuse his pleas and leave with the market man the following morning. However, that night, I was struck with a terrible fever. I knew what kind of treatment patients received at the hospital, and the thought of being taken there was unbearable. Morning came, and my condition was discovered. Thetford immediately fled the house and refused to return until I had been removed. I was unaware of what awaited me until three rough men barged into my room and revealed their mission. They demanded that I pay for my crimes. I pleaded with them, invoking the name of Thetford and his wife. I begged for a moment to speak with them and perhaps gain some mercy. But they were deaf to my pleas and proceeded to carry out their task with force. I was consumed with rage and terror, hurling curses and insults at my murderer and the men he had chosen to carry out his bidding. My screams and struggles proved to be futile. My memory of the events that followed is hazy at best. My illness and emotions had driven me to a state of madness. Every movement was excruciatingly painful, and the journey to the hospital was unbearable. The scorching sun, the hard boards, and the rough pavement made me feel like I was being torn apart. I'm surprised I didn't die before the cart had even moved three steps. When I arrived at the hospital, I was barely conscious. I opened my eyes and slowly regained my senses. 
I was lying on a mattress that was in such poor condition that it seemed like a corpse had just been dragged from it. The room was overcrowded with beds, each occupied by a person in a desperate state. The stench in the air was suffocating and overwhelming, making it difficult to breathe. There was no proper sanitation, and the room was filled with the odours of illness and medicine. I cannot begin to describe the pain and suffering I endured during my time in that hospital. But it is a story that must be told, a tale of horror and despair that will haunt me for the rest of my days. My closest neighbour was on the brink of death, and my bed, which I had carelessly extended, was damp with the vile matter that had flowed from his stomach. It's almost unbelievable that in this scene of horror, the sound of laughter could still be heard. While the upper floors of this building were filled with the sick and dying, the lower levels were a place of revelry and joy. The hired workers, who were paid exorbitant wages to tend to the sick and dispose of the dead, neglected their duties and consumed the medicine meant for the patients, indulging in debauchery and rioting. Every so often, a bloated, malevolent face would peer in, belonging to a woman who was drunk. Dying eyes would plead with her, begging for a drop of cold water or for help changing position so that they wouldn't have to see the ghastly contortions or deathly smiles of their neighbours. But the visitor had only left the party for a moment to see who had died. If she entered the room, her bleary eyes and unsteady gait made it clear that she was in no condition to offer the aid that was so desperately needed. Soon enough, she disappeared, and others took her place on the staircase. A coffin was deposited at the door, and the poor soul whose heart still beat was seized by rough hands and dragged along the floor into the hallway. It's hard to fathom the suffering that millions of our fellow human beings are forced to endure. This misery was even more terrifying because it was caused by the depravity of those who were supposed to be caring for the sick and dying. Only my own eyes could convince me that such enormous wickedness existed. It's no wonder that so many people would rather die alone in garrets, cellars and stables than be brought to a place like this. A doctor noticed my condition and gave some instructions to the person who was attending to him. I was completely unaware of what the nurses were trying to do, and even if they had attempted it, I would have refused whatever they offered. My recovery seemed impossible and undesirable. The constant display of sick patients entering the room, most of whom passed away within a few hours, and the preparation of graves for them reminded me of my own impending fate. Three days went by, and each hour felt like it could be my last. The fact that I survived amidst such a contagious and deadly atmosphere, with causes of destruction accumulating every moment, feels like a miracle. It's almost unbelievable that out of all those who entered the house, I was the only one to come out alive. Some inexplicable force seemed to protect me from those deadly enemies of human life. My fever disappeared, my strength returned, and my first thought was to escape from the suffering and contemplation of those evils. Chapter 16 After satisfying my curiosity, Wallace proceeded to remind me of our first meeting. He had doubts about whether I was the same person he had encountered at Lesher's. I confirmed that I was indeed the one, and asked him about his behavior during that encounter. To be honest, he hesitated, I only meant to tease your naivety and ignorance, but please don't think that my plan was well thought out or malicious. My intentions at the tavern were genuine. I wanted to help you, not harm you. It wasn't until I reached the top of the stairs that the mischievous idea came to me. I didn't plan anything beforehand. It was all done in the moment. Upon returning to the parlour, Thetford had assigned me with the task of delivering a message in a far-off part of the city. It wasn't until I had completed this errand and was making my way back that I fully contemplated the potential consequences of my actions. It was clear that Thetford and his wife would catch you in their bedroom. Perhaps in your impatience, you had already undressed and crawled into bed. The couple would have prepared to join you, only to discover a strapping young lad sound asleep in their place. The very thought of this scenario, which had previously brought me amusement, now filled me with dread.' 